as I am kind of getting ready to transition in my life, and I'm thinking of the messages that God has really used to establish my life, to give me a blessed life, to give me a blessed future, and really this is the value of uh, growing old in God, getting uh, to see how your life has played out over decades, and see the faithfulness of God, see that he is faithful to his promises, and so... Uh, I think as I'm, as I'm sharing each of these messages that if there's something I would like to hand you as a gift of insight, of understanding, that would have a profound impact as it's had a profound impact on my life. My life and my wife and my life are, is blessed. Um, and it's blessed beyond the things you can see. It's blessed with eternal realities. But those realities, very often, everything God has for us is accessed by faith. And so uh, every good gift, the Bible says, come down from the Father of lights. And so those things that really last require faith to access those eternal realities. And so I want to talk about that today. Tennessee Williams uh, was once asked, uh, what was the secret of happiness? And he said one word. He said, insensitivity. That's not quite the answer, right? <laughs> Just be as callous as you can be. Don't let anything affect you. Uh, just turn your heart really into it's all about me. And really the opposite is really true. Uh, not being overly sensitive and, you know, that, that no matter whatever's happening, you're like a yo-yo going up and down. But I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit at any given moment. Why am I alive? What is God asking of me? What is he drawing me into? What script has he written for my life that is so wonderful, so marvelous, that I want to trust him as I step into it? It's going to turn out, work for my good. His promise is, all things work together for my good if I love him, and I'm committed to his purpose more than my purpose. And so the creator of the universe, the creator of happiness, knows how we can find happiness. And so my message, you know, we're talking about winning the war within, and we're looking in Galatians 5 at the fruit of God's Spirit. How do you know you're flowing in God's Spirit? And Galatians 5.22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Well, you know, a lot of us, we, we love those first three. It's like love, we sang about love, joy, peace. Then we threw a little righteousness in there. But don't get too hung up on that. Just stick with the love, joy, peace. But the reality is all those things are a part of representing God. Yeah, love, joy, peace is a part of it. But ultimately, patience, which again is a challenging word. Uh, Brandon talked did a great job last week talking about that and kindness. And then generosity. Um, generosity is another word for goodness, same word. Being generous. God's a generous God. God so loved, he gave. You know, God so loved, he didn't consume. God so loved, he wasn't insensitive. God so loved, he was sensitive to the needs of his creation, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so the message, again, is the key to happiness, how to become a hilarious giver. Why would I use the word hilarious? Because God does. Uh, he talks about, in the, in the word it says, be a cheerful giver. Well, that word, the Greek word is hilarios, where you get the word hilarious. God's excited about giving. I always tell, if a person's a giver, is when people start talking about giving, is their heart quickened? <laughs> yeah. Or are they going, oh, no, we're talking about giving. No, I can't believe we're talking about giving. Are we a river that God's flowing through? And, um, you know, Paul the Apostle said this in Acts 20. It's more blessed. Jesus said it's more blessed to give. Makes one happier in the Amplified Version. More to be envied to give than to receive. You know, when it says it's hard to find a rich man in 10 with a satisfied mind, it's talking about those who consume it for themselves. But when you see a giver, I mean, when, you know, when people, thousands of them went to India to work with Mother Teresa, not because of the perks around the pool, uh, but it was because she was laying her life down and they were so drawn to her giving heart, they wanted to be around someone who had found true wealth, and they did things that they didn't think they, could, think they could do. So what would make you happier in the long run? Would it make you happier to be a stagnant pond with nothing flowing in or out? Or would it make you happier to be a rushing river? Now, the, the challenge in life is that we all think, well, I don't have enough to give. And, and yet we all have something to give. 
Every one of us have something to give. I mean, the Bible talks about time, talents, and treasures. Every one of us, we have the same amount of time every day. You know, none of us have a longer day or a shorter day. And uh, all of us have been given talents. You know, the Bible talked about that person who had one talent, if you will, and buried it in the ground, didn't use it. And then the person who had been given more than one multiplied it. Even the person who had been given a lot multiplied it a great deal. So what am I going to do with the talents, the grace that God has given me? Um, I think about a syndrome uh, that we call the terrible twos. And uh, it basically is this. You exist to bless me. And right now, in our children's ministry, we are trying to help our children break out of the terrible twos. Because they'll be grabbing for the same toy. They'll be wanting what they want. And this is the challenge. I mean, I've seen older people who are brats, and I know they were once young brats. And they continue to grow into the older brats. And so the challenge for us, are we going to be that river that God flows through, or are we going to be stuck in that dimension? Now, none of us are born givers. We're all born takers. None of us had to learn how to be takers, okay? We're born master takers. We know exactly how to grasp for something. The challenge is, can I learn to be a giver that God flows through? So giving is not God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising children. You know, none of us, you want your kids to be selfish. None of you are saying as they go to bed at night, Lord, make my child as selfish as possible. None of you have best friends who are totally selfish. Somehow your best friend made room for you in their life. And your best friend has proven at a certain point that they will be there for you. They will not uh, eliminate you because maybe you have failed or you've messed up. And also would say, do we have best friends that we are reaching out to? Do we have friends that we're willing to climb over walls to keep that relationship intact? You know, we, we live in a world where more and more people get uh, encased in their own little lives. We have the mediums of the age that can make us sit at home and entertain ourselves. You know, we have garage doors that go down automatically. We don't have to reach uh, our neighbors. And so the challenge, will I become a pond or a river. What is, what is God asking me to do? The Bible says, first of all, God, what is God like? If we're created in the image and likeness of God, what is God like? Well, God owns everything. So he doesn't have to give to anyone. He has a choice as to what he wants to do. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's, everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So if God wanted to be selfish, he could do whatever he wants. He's God. He chooses to give. God so loved he gave. God is a giver, and therefore he has put that seed in our hearts that we want to be givers as well, deep in our hearts. First of all, all of us are incredibly blessed when someone gives to us. I just wrote a, and I, I ran into someone uh, signing books here a month or so ago who shared a story that they uh, take care of a special needs autistic child who has seizures and throws fits, and sometimes it's very, very difficult to take care of that child. And one day they pulled into a drive through coffee, and they were not looking forward to going to work. It was a very rough day the day before, and someone ahead of them um, bought, paid for, paid forward a $4 cup of coffee. And just that $4, you think, oh, it's just $4. But that somehow arriving at that window and that someone wanted to bless their life, it made their day. They said, it made my day. Better than if they had found a $20 bill on a street. It's not a question of just, well, I've, you could find a $50 bill. It wouldn't bless you as much as someone, yeah. someone doing something. Why is that? We're wired to love not just receiving, because it's harder to receive than to give. Jesus said, you'll be happier giving than receiving. Sometimes I find it gets very difficult to receive at times. There's an awkwardness there. Um, anyway, I, I think it gets me emotional at times because there have been times of, of receiving where, gosh, man, I'd love to, I just let me give here, okay? I don't want to be in this. And I remember we, we have done here at The Rock in years gone by giving and receiving lines where we say, if you want to give something to someone else, some finances, stand in this line. 
if you want to receive, stand in this line. <laughs> I mean, we had very moving moments. I remember one woman came here for the first time and someone gave her $1,000. She was happy. <laughs> I mean, again, who knew? I don't know who did it, but someone was led. And you may be thinking, I, I wish someone would give me. Well, why don't you think, I wish I was the person that could give $1,000. In other words, if we're thinking, I wish someone would give me. Give me, give me, give me. Well, that's the terrible twos, okay? That's, we're still stuck in that mindset. It's not about us. And that's really the, the goal in life. How can I learn to be a steward of what God has given me? And I'll say this too, as I get older, um, you know, th there are things that I don't do as well as I once did. Someone, you know, texted me this week and said, you know, there are some celebrities who are watching one of your messages in L.A. right now. And then they sent me the link to the message. And as I watched that message, for, for a few minutes I thought, wow, I used to preach pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, you know? <laughs> but the reality is, you know, you get, you get older and, you know, it's just, it's just not quite the same. <laughs> But then I thought, you know, I'll just be really candid with you guys. Yesterday I went to speak to um, um, people who are directors of crisis pregnancies all over California. They met at a hotel and they invited me to speak about my background with abortions, but also about the transition I'm going through. And uh, some of them are, will be transitioning, are transitioning, should transition. You know, they were all in that process. And I just said to them, which, you know, I've said it to a few people, but... Um, I'm not as excited about preaching as I once was. I am a lot more excited about talking to some person I may never meet on this earth about getting healthy. All of a sudden, I'm crawling through the phone, talking to people. Somehow, that rings my bell. The point I'm making is, what is God asking you to do at any given moment? I'll, I'll be a good steward of whatever. But I want to stay in the spirit. Because I, as you get older, guys, I mean, at some point, you may not be hitting home runs. You may be bunting. <laughs> Just make it a good bunt. And, and make it a bunt that God asked you to do. Yeah. I mean, in, in life, I, I have had, you know, some senior saints that have blessed me immeasurably. A single sentence, a little hug, a, a look. I mean, just a kind word. I was with my father in the Lord last weekend. I, I didn't put a picture up, but... His wife passed away, and I went up to visit him, spent a few hours with him. I think it was last Sunday. It could have been the Sunday before, but God knows. Anyway, so <laughs> it was just wonderful. He's 84 years old, just sitting with him, this treasured man. Mm. But he still had something to give me, every sentence that he would share, because he knows Jesus. Your values control your destiny. Your values are not just what you believe, they're how you live. And what I would say to you too, I mean, people say, well, this is what I believe about marriage. Well, let me just see your wife. <laughs> this is what I believe about raising kids. Let me just see your kids. Let's just talk, about, let's just deal with reality here. I got really quiet in the room. Okay. <laughs> they're not what you believe. People are espousing all kinds of things. But what are you, how are you living? And that's why it's always a full court press. I can't run on the fumes of yesterday. I can't live on, boy, I used to, well, that's awesome, Francis. <laughs> what you used to, if it ain't happening today, then the question you really should be asking is why? You know, one of my life mantras, I have nothing better to do than love people. Am I still loving people? Why would I be loving people? Well, my creator is love. And he wants me to love like he loves. That's why I'm breathing for me. And there's a grace there to do that. So we can either get our values from two places, the culture, which is learning to get, or from Christ, learning to give. God so loved, he gave. Jesus came to serve, not be served. He laid his life down. He poured his life out. And again, what I would say to you too, again, if you want to have faith, more faith, You've got to get in the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You, you could have 10 Bibles on a coffee table. 
and not grow in faith. You could, you know, prop them up, have fruit and flowers in front of them, shine lights on them. The only scripture that is helping you is the stuff you know. And I'm constantly, re- and I, I do it all the time. I'm coming down here today. I'm listening to the word. I'm washing myself with the word. I'm washing myself with the word. That's how I get faith to believe God. And again, the culture says, be careful you don't give too much because you may not have enough at the end. And the Bible says, I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm not saying be foolish. I'm saying be obedient. I expect my best years are ahead. I expect a bountiful harvest. Why would a farmer expect a harvest? Because he planted seed. I'm trying to get, my life goal has been, I want to get as much seed in the ground as I can. I have time, I have talents, I have treasures. That's my life goal. So then I shouldn't be shocked if I'm anticipating a harvest. Of course I'm expecting a harvest. I believe I've got incredible seeds in the ground. That's not boasting. That's being conscious. (laughs) Have I sowed some bad seeds? Yeah, I've sowed some bad seeds. I've asked forgiveness. I've asked forgiveness of people. But I've also been endeavoring not just to sow bad seed, but sow good seed and believing for that seed to come to pass. So the Bible says, don't conform in Romans 12 to the standards of this fallen world. What are they? First John says, for all these worldly things, and it talks about three things Jesus said. These evil desires, the craze, it's in the, the message, the craze for sex, the ambition to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance These are not from God. Interesting, two out of three of them involve money and things. I didn't write this. Don't get upset with me. (laughs) But this is part of the seduction of life. What are you building? Are you building your little kingdom or are you building his kingdom? Your kingdom will be gone really soon, like 45 more minutes gone. And so... I want to sow for eternal things. Paul said, for me to live is as luxuriously as I possibly can. Is that what he said? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know, I I want to be excited about laying my life down, not dread it. I want to be excited about God asking me to give, not dread it. God is asking me to give regularly of my time, my talents, and my treasures. He's not trying to empty my bank account. He's trying to open my heart. He's not, he's not trying to empty me. He's trying to fill me. So what would you say is for you to live? For you to live as your kids, your career, your things. What, what is the thing that rings your bell the most? I understand we all need some downtime. We all need to relax and rest and enjoy life. That's it. But I've had some incredible meals but none of them would be listed as the top 100 events of my life. I had a steak once. <laughs> no, it's not even in the 1,000 top things of my life. So Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek what? Seek first the kingdom of God. The God of the universe would know what we should seek first. We're hardwired for that. Seek first God's kingdom. God is willing. The Bible says that God in the message in Matthew 5, God is willing to give an obscurity. He says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. He doesn't grandstand. The God of the universe who's made every beautiful thing, he doesn't have this morning sunrise is brought to you by God. (laughs) And every flower has a little stand made in heaven. Don't forget where it came from. He allows atheists to watch his sunrise and sunsets. He doesn't charge an atheist. He doesn't say, just for all your atheists, remember, it's me, you guys. I did this. I was an an atheist for seven years. I watched sunsets and sunrises and enjoyed them all. And he didn't charge me. One of the most familiar verses that we know is, give and it shall be given to you. It just, it just it flows. Give it and shall be given to you. Give it and shall be given to you. 
God could say, give, and don't ask me why. Give or else. You better give. I mean, he, he can write whatever script he wants. If, if you're thinking he's just powerful, you know, there are totalitarian dictators who are powerful, but there's nothing generous about their power. I mean, now the former chaplain of the U.S. Senate, Richard Halverson, wrote, Jesus Christ said more about money than about any other single thing. Because when it comes to a man's real nature, money is of first importance. Money is an exact index of a man's true character. Jesus spent 15% of his recorded words in the Bible talking about money. Remember when rich Zacchaeus said that he would give half of his money. This is a guy who had been stealing from people. He said he would give half his money to the poor and pay back four times those he had cheated. Well, Jesus didn't say, hey, great idea. Give me knuckles. Come on, that's awesome. Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. Ooh, man, that's better than a knuckle sandwich. You see, the truth is, either God's the Lord of our money, because wherever your treasure is, there's your heart, or he's not Lord at all. Again, I've said this before. My wife asked me on our wedding day to be 100% faithful. She's obsessed over this thing. I mean, how about on my birthday? I may be unfaithful. She goes, no, I want 100% faithful. How many think that's unreasonable? Would you stand right now? <laughs> we expect humans to be 100% faithful. Well, thank God God is faithful. And thank God that he's asking us, even though we mess up. I mean, it isn't like God's surprised we messed up. He had a plan called send a savior to die for your sins because we knew we would. So the problem is we don't know what we have. Oftentimes, you know, a blind man can't tell a pebble from a diamond. And so if we're blind, we'll miss opportunities. We'll miss God. God saying, just open your heart, give. Now, you've heard me say over the years, opportunities I've missed to love people. Opportunities I've missed to when the Holy Spirit was tugging on me to say something or do something. And they branded me with conviction. I don't want to experience that again. I didn't even know what I missed. They're just lodged as empty holes, the caverns of my past. I missed something. But now the joy in life is, how can I stay conscious? And I'm still, there's still things that I'm missing. I, you know, I see people and they're, they're walking by and God gives me a sentence and I don't get it. And I get in the car and I think I should have said that or, you know, I should have done this. And, I, and again, I'm not walking around paranoid, you know, freaking out. No, but... I'm trying to get in the flow of staying conscious, not walking in my sleep, not talking in my sleep. God's tugging on me regular, call so-and-so, you know, reach out to just, and, and serendipitously, there's opportunities around me, around you, all the time. I uh, worked in a casino when I was a young Christian in Lake Tahoe, um, and I remember a maid had taken a napkin on a dresser and thrown it in the garbage. And in that na- necklace, in that napkin was a tens of thousands of dollar necklace. And they shut down the garbage department and they had security guards posted checking every uh, person working there. <laughs> and for two days, the garbage piled up and they went through every stick of those garbage until they found the necklace. Well, I mean, sometimes in our lives, we've got to rummage through the garbage of life. There's a lot of garbage in life. Do you notice that at all? There's a lot of stuff here. To find the diamonds of opportunity. And the diamond are opportunities that God's given us. I don't really care um, whether my life, whether a certain day is filled with the most exciting things or the most boring things. It doesn't make any difference. Because tucked in there are diamond opportunities. And that's part of the reason why I listen to the Word a lot is because 
I just, I'd rather come to the highest ground I can. And I oftentimes I'm getting gems, I'm getting gems, I'm getting gems, I'm getting pearls, I'm getting, wow, that's awesome. Because I don't, I don't have, want to waste my time. I want to redeem the time as Jesus asked me to. The inventor of dynamite and other high explosives, which were used as weapons of destruction even, once read his obituary that had been mistakenly put in a paper. It was actually his brother had died and they put his obituary in the paper and it said that he had become rich by enabling people to kill each other in record numbers. How would you like to read that obituary? His name was Alfred Nobel. He founded the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> he decided, you know what? I want to use my wealth for good. Maybe some of us need that wake-up call. We need to imagine what would our obituary be. You know, I think as I'm getting ready to transition, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an intense moment of reflection. It's a very real moment of reflection. I can't really talk about it. It's such a moment of reflection. But, um, and it's filled with a lot of emotion of joy and excitement and anticipation uh, and then sadness because, you know, the transitions in life are real and things will not be exactly as they have been. And I've really enjoyed how they've been. I've been blessed. My life is blessed. I love people. I love being here. I'm, uh, you know, and yet God's got a next for me that I'm excited about. Not that I'm not going to be here. I'm just not going to be here in this capacity. You know, my father died a wealthy, famous man. Miserable. Eh. I was 17. I noticed. I noticed. And so I've never pursued. It didn't mean anything to me. Pursue stuff. I became, I retired at 21 as a hippie. I retired. <laughs> Came out of retirement, but. <laughs> Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then to his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Would we sell all that we had to find that treasure called heaven? Kingdom of heaven is hidden. It's hidden. So here are three recommendations, three suggestions on being a giver. Number one, give generously. Don't be stingy. Don't be a miser. I love the movie Christmas Carol, the original version I saw, 1951 version with Alistair Sim was uh, Scrooge. And he came to his senses and went to his nephew's house finally and came in the room and they would never thought they would have seen him again. And he said, would you forgive a pig-headed old fool for having no eyes to see nor ears to hear all these years? And that to me, if that's not a born again expression. Would you forgive a pig-headed old fool for having no eyes to hear and no ears to hear? Anyway, you got the point. <laughs> if you can't see with your eyes, let me tell you something. <laughs> or hear with your ears. Mark 14, while he, Jesus, was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man, just heard this on the way down today, known as Simon the leper. I just love this. Jesus is hanging out with Simon the leper. Not a lot of folks were hanging out with Simon. He was unclean. No one went to Simon's house. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure spike nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. You would think from the response of people that she had broken the jar on his head. No. She broke the jar and then poured the perfume on his head two days before Passover, two days before he would be crucified, anointing him for burial. Someone, she didn't know. It wasn't like, I'm doing, no. She just was being obedient. This is part of the thing about life, guys. I don't want to miss amazing adventures that God's written for my life. I want to be fully conscious. I'll just give you some expectations. I expect to live a very long time. I expect to be healthy. If I die sooner, I'll just go to heaven. <laughs> I can handle that. I've cancel I'll cancel my schedule at that time. <laughs> but I'm not going to dread the future. 
I want you to be excited about your, but why should you be excited about your future if you're sowing two things, squat and diddly? <laughs> I mean, you're going to reap what you sow in life. That's just a, a fixed law. A farmer should not go to a field he hasn't planted in. You can't go to a field. Did you, what did you do? I did nothing in this field. Then leave. Go home. The, the old proverb, you know, don't look for your ship to come in if you haven't sent your ship out. No one's standing by a shore waiting for something if you never sent it out. So what happens? Verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And in particular, Judas, who kept the money, was the guy lamenting it because he thought about, I could have gotten all that money for myself. He was a thief. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. I want to do a beautiful thing for Jesus, to Jesus. I really don't care. Everything else is it's going to burn, guys. Why am I going to waste my time building sandcastles? You ever watch a kid building a sandcastle and the ocean's coming in and they're crying because it's getting washed away? Well, you built it too close to the shore and it's, it's not going to last anyway. Again, the value of having a father died successfully when you're 17 and he chased the wind, it has value. I don't want to chase the wind. I did chase the wind, selfish pleasures, but I didn't chase material wind. The poor, Jesus continues, will have with you always. And you can help them anytime you want, but you will not have me always. She did what she could. She did what she could. That sentence, she did what she could. What can I do? Am I doing what I can? I can't do everything. I mean, if you, if you only make $500 a week, you can't give $1,000 a month to missions. It's probably not going to happen. You do what you can. The widow who gave the two mites Jesus said had given more than all the wealthy people who gave out of their abundance. Just wrote a check. Didn't affect their livelihood. Didn't affect how they lived. I tell you the truth. And again, Jesus never has to say, you know, let me break from tradition. And I'll just be truthful. I mean, every sentence he said was truthful. But what he's saying right now, I will tell you something amazing. I will tell you something that will blow your minds. This is amazing. She said, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, this is a prophecy. This is thrown in the long ball. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in her memory. How many of you, wherever the gospel is preached, they're talking about things you've done? This unknown quantity, this nameless person in the Bible took something very precious, poured it out on Jesus, was mocked for doing it. And let me say, if you're going to be a Christ follower, you will be mocked. I, again, I saw it in one of the chapters I was listening to on the way down. You know, if they hated me, they'll hate you. It's just the way it is. Not that we are obnoxious and they'll hate us, but that's just the way it is. If you're going to follow Jesus, the world's not going to affirm you in that. So we can always get more money, but we can never get more time. And our talents are God's gift to us. What we do with them is our gift to God. People say, if I just had his or her gifts, you know, I think that's one of the value of celebrities is you see people with incredible gifts who basically, um, we learn from them that riches and fame don't make a person better. <laughs> I mean, as, as you watch, you know, the famous die and, you know, have broken lives and you go, I don't think there's a, you know, even Kevin Costner said, I can't think of one thing that makes fame worth it. Not one good thing. So don't, don't wish, and again, 80% of young people want to be rich and famous. And that's a sad reality because it's not going to satisfy. Second thing, give joyfully. Jesus said, or Paul said, actually, remember this. Why would Paul say remember this? Because we're going to forget it. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he has received in his heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. For God loves a hilarious giver, a cheerful giver. Not hysterically. I don't have to, you know, 
be anxious about giving. I want to be anxious for nothing. There's a, there's a time when I have to say no. A good no can spare you a lot of pain. A lot of us have said yes to things. You should have said no. There are things I begged God to do that were good projects. I'm glad he didn't do it. I'm glad he didn't do it. I don't want to be doing that. I would have been consigned to something I wouldn't have wanted to do over time. Deuteronomy. You know, God doesn't want to clean you out. He wants to clean you in. He gave you manna, Jesus, God did, in the, to eat in the desert. Something your fathers had never known. Why? To humble you and test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. You know, we're all going to be humbled and tested. What's the end goal? The end goal is it's going to go well. Don't, don't whine when you're humbled and tested. Rejoice. Hum, the Bible even says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I'm not waiting for God to humble me. That's ridiculous. You don't want to wait that long. <laughs> you know, I like a strategy of humility. A strategy of humility, if God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud, then God, where can I, in obedience, be humble and activate your grace? It's called a strategy of humility. What can I do now that will humble me to activate your grace and see the life and power of God? Guys, this is the way to live. I'm talking, this is it. This is like my will and testament here. This is how to live. Any other way to live, you're wasting your life. Why, why live that way? Live, be a giver. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you say, well, I'm not sowing anything. You show everyone's sowing something. Right now, as you're listening, you're sowing. You're sowing faith in what you're hearing, belief in where you're going. Could you shut up? You know, I want to go home. What time's lunch? Keep, you know, <sighs> change the subject. <laughs> we are all sowing something. And whatever we're sowing, we're going to reap. If we're sowing stingy, you're going to reap stingy. Sowing generous, you're going to reap generous. 2 Corinthians 9. We're almost done. God is able to make all grace abound to you. How much grace? All. So that in how many things? All. At how many times? All. Having how much? All. All, wow, there's a lot of alls here. All that you need so you will abound in every good work. So when he says, God's able, God's able, God's able, then he gives you the key to that. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower, who supplies the seed? God. It, he provides the seed for a good attitude, for a good response, for an obedient act. He'll provide that seed. He'll give you the grace you need to do. And bread for food will also supply your store of seed. I love that. I want to have a store of seed. I don't want to be, I can't. I don't want to be, I don't have it. I want to be, if you're asking me to do it, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And we'll enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 9. And what will happen then? You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now, a lot of you think this is hyperbole. This is an overstatement. Come on, God. Well, yeah, every obedient moment. In life, you're going to go, you're not going to be led to do that. You're not going to be led to do that. You're not giving your time, talents, and treasures to every person you see the rest of your life. You'd go crazy. Generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to many. Number three, give obediently. If God can hold get a hold of your money, he can get a hold of your heart. If he can get a hold of your time, he can get a hold of your heart. If he can get a hold of your talents, he can get a hold of your heart. So give obediently. If you want to be rich, give. If you want to be poor, grasp. If you want to be abundant, scatter. If you want to be needy, hoard. Many people know what they want to have, but they don't know what they want to be. I want to be a giver. What I have is insignificant. Because what I have, I can't take with me. <laughs> What I be, I can take with me. I'm not sure that's English. <laughs> and you can only give what you've received. If I haven't received God's forgiveness, I can't offer you full forgiveness. I've never received it. 
If I have not received God's love, I can't offer you God's love. I haven't received it. If you don't have grace to love yourself, you can't love other people. That's why love others as you love yourself. I remember as a young Christian, I was like a few months in the Lord, and a guy came through, blowing through the community, and he preached the message, you guys need to love, love yourself. You guys need to love yourself. And he was like, whoa. And he was talking about, but you can't love others if you don't first love yourself. Self-hatred is the most common hatred of all. Why, why are the most memorable things acts of giving? My niece went to Poland as a missionary. And as she was leaving, the family who had next to nothing that she was staying with took the only picture they had on any wall and gave it to her because she said she liked it. They didn't go into their warehouse of pictures. <laughs> Are you being convicted? If you are, you're awake. Because the life of of knowing God is going to be a challenge. Joy is Jesus, others, and then you. You're the caboose. He's the engine. Why does God, why are first fruits better? Why is cream better? Why do none of us want God to think of us last? Because there's something about the first. That's why, you know, for me, again, when I was young, I would stay up late at night and pray and go for walks at night. And the Bible does say in the evening and the morning were the first day. And so that was nocturnal. Now I'm older and I get up really early. I like getting up early. I like, give me some quiet time. Give me time just to be in God and just get my life together. None of us want leftovers. We want the first fruits, the best. And I I believe giving God our best of our time, talents, and treasures. Keyboard, if you would, someone please, maybe Horatio. 2 Corinthians 8, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Again, God could do whatever he wanted. He could have come as a king, you know, promenading through town. Or he could come as a humble servant. And the irony, again, I love this sentence. There's a humble servant sitting on a throne. <laughs> you, want to impress, whoops. you want to impress God? There's a humble servant sitting on a throne. That will change how you view what matters. You're not going to impress a humble servant. Unless you have that heart. Yet for your sakes he became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. See, rich. You say, well, that's just in the spirit realm. We're just rich in the spirit realm. And that, that's true. If you know Jesus, you're rich. You're part of the 6% of the people on the planet who are born again. That's pretty amazing. And if you have a quality of life and are born again, if your quality of spiritual life, you could be in the top 1% or 2% if you really know Jesus and are flowing with him. That's amazing. You are wealthy in the spirit. But even the natural realm, how about this? If you have sufficient food, decent clothes, live in a house that keeps the weather out, own a reasonably reliable means of transportation, you are among the 15% of the world's wealthiest people. Ouch. Let's add to that. If you have money saved, any amount, a hobby that requires some equipment, fishing, hunting, skiing, golf, a variety of clothes in your closet, and not just your one clothes or two sets, two cars in any condition, live in your own home and not sharing it with someone else. You are among the top 5% of the wealthiest. This room is some of the wealthiest people who ever lived. (laughs) And we say, if I had more, I'd give more. No, you wouldn't. What we do is who we are. What we give is who we are. You know, tell someone from Mexico or Cuba or Haiti you're not rich. They're not migrating here for the weather. (laughs) I remember talking to a pastor who was helping Russian Christians come to Sacramento, of which we have lots. 
And he said, I remember taking them to just a normal supermarket. And I'm walking down the aisle with them. And finally, they're, they're stopped and they're huddling. <laughs> and they're just crying. And they said, never in our wildest dreams could we imagine people living like people you think are rich are really the super rich, the mega rich. Many Americans have a poverty mindset. A poverty mindset says, I can't, I, I don't have enough. I, I, gotta hold, I gotta hold on to what I have. I can't give you a hug right now because I'm really short on hugs. I can't give you a smile because I'm not feeling that good. I don't want to smile. I'm working with a dear friend I've known for a number of years who had a stroke, a pastor. He hasn't come out of his house since the stroke. So I'm sending him one of my books just to kind of spoon feed him. But he made a commitment two days ago. He said, okay, I'm going down to Starbucks. I'm going to walk down to Starbucks. I'm going to limp down to Starbucks. And I'm speaking into his life because he's still a brilliant guy. His voice is fine. His body's just messed up. I said, you know, the mediums of this age, my friend, are going to enable you to talk to people you'll never meet on this earth, and you're going to help them. Because you're part of that, I believe, 1% who really know Jesus, though you're stuck right now. You're barricaded in your room. Who is there? that if you got whole enough, if you became a river that God could flow through, that you could help them. You could climb over the walls of hurt and pain and love them. I want to live convicted. I want to live convicted. I love the expression, if you're not living close to the edge, you're taking up too much room. <laughs> Father, we, um, again, who is sufficient for these things? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. Our planting and watering is nothing without your increase, Lord. If you didn't author it, we'll never finish it. It's not even worth doing. So we're not having to be creative we don't have to be creative. We just have to be obedient. That's where the sweet spot is. What are you asking each of us to be? And out of that being, what are you asking us to do? How are you asking us to give of our time, our talents, our treasures? None of us have been shortchanged. All of us have been lavishly overpaid. If you've just been in some way challenged by this word today, you've allowed it to go in your heart, it's gone past every sentry, every roadblock, every barricade, and you've allowed the word to seep into your heart in some way, just stand, just stand with me. I'm standing. I got convicted. I got slapped around in this word. I'll have to say it again in a few minutes. Lord, we stand in your presence today, God. We're not ashamed. We're honored that you can still wake us up. We're honored that we can still hear your voice. You said, my sheep, hear my voice. We're breathing with, with divine intent. We're alive because you have a script for us that's amazing. Just say with me, I'm excited about my future. Because God wrote the script. And everything he writes is awesome. I trust you, Lord, with my life, with my future. Open my heart to be a river that you flow through. Help me to give like you have given to me of my time, my talents, and my treasures. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me first. Thank you for modeling for me what true love is. You said true love is laying down your life. I want to lay down my life. 
that I might truly live. Lord, I bless your people, Lord. I thank you for each one in this room. I thank you for each of their hearts and minds, their lives. I pray that they, as they walk out, may be shaking their head going, wow, what do I do with that? That you would show them what they can do, line upon line, step by step, here a little, there a little, from glory to glory. They don't have to rush out to do something. They just need to learn to flow, learn to dance, let you lead, and you will guide them step by step. You'll baby step them the rest of their life. But I bless them now in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Everyone said, amen. If you need prayer.